Yay! <laughs> I'll find it, Zed. You're all kind of. Hey, guys. Hey, hey there. Hey, how nice are you? Ward. Chris, you're sideways, buddy. I see you sideways. Hey, there you go. Chris and Beckett, so good to see you all. Got Andrew. Oh, how fun is this? Cameron, what a treat. Got a horse team. Got the Hussey family. I recognize that one coming on. It's my mother. What is this? You guys, you guys are the early birds. You're right on time. It's 10 o'clock by our watch here in uh, in Oregon. And so we're uh, super glad you guys get to see you talk, Angie. How fun. I don't know how to start the video. No, I so great. Amanda Smith. Yeah. Up there. Andrew Richards. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Well, we'll give folks a moment to pop on. And uh, before we kick this whole thing off, thank you for taking the time to be here. We're super excited to be with you guys today. Uh, yes. It's very grateful. Hey, there's Priya. It's good to see you guys. There's pets. Oh, my word. There's so many fun faces here. Donna and Emily. Good to see you guys. Uh, I'll say, look at you guys. Very fun. All right. We're just piling in. Oh, my word. This is so fun. Okay. Well, hey. I need to clean it. No. Okay. Okay. Well, here's the deal. We see you guys popping on, and, and we're just going to go over a couple basic uh, housekeeping rules to do. She did the same thing, but uh, what we're going to do is ask you uh, to mute yourself when you come on, if you would, um, unless we have a, an open discussion part and you're able to interact because there's a lot of good family activity going on I'm sure in your home and uh please move in the shade and, and so just try to do that if you would all right and we're gonna have a chat feature here it's at the very bottom of your screen if you open it up um and if you're not in full screen go ahead and uh open up chat and then look up on the right hand side and Cheryl can you mute everybody hi uh-oh, it needed Chad. Cheryl, can you see me trying to cut around the door? All right, there we go. That's a little better, I think. You guys, can we get everybody to see that thing? The mute. Like in the middle, also, so someone yeah. just started talking. And show up straight, and they're like in the kitchen making a oh, lot of background noise. Chad, if you if you can make me co-host, I'll help you with that. I'm happy to help if you want to make me co-host. Cheryl. Can... Yeah, I muted everybody, and oh, you can't hear me. Let's see. Cheryl, we did. We you did a good job there. It looks like. Yeah, I muted everyone. <laughs> okay. Hey guys. No, we're good. Okay, good. All right, guys. Thank you again so much. And and again, we're gonna keep you on mute just because of background noise. And if we uh, if we get into a discussion phase or whatever, you can open your hands and 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 get noticed, and then we'll unmute you. Okay. But just again, want to go before the Lord. We're so excited to have this time with you, and uh, just trust that the Lord is really in this uh, for all of us in our marriages today. So let's just bow our heads. Dear Lord, what a privilege it is to just come before you. And just acknowledge you as the creator of the universe, the one who made us, the one who knows every cell of our bodies, the one who gives us life and breath, the one who designed marriage, who designed and created male and female, the one who laid out your word for us as a, a life-giving roadmap to wellness, to, to marriage fidelity and thriving. Lord, you, you've just spoken to every issue that affects our life. You gave us your Holy Spirit to dwell within us so that we might live in a manner that is supernatural. Lord, the things that you've called us to do are beyond us. And that's so beautiful. Marriage, it's beyond us. But yet it's so in your realm of 
activity that's where you want to thrive and where you want to speak in and through us and so today we just invite you here we just want your spirit to have full sway we want to hear from you we want your word to minister to our hearts we want marriages to be just refreshed today encouraged in you to find delight in in your vision your plans for us lord to look at some of the questions being given and hopefully lord it's look through the lens of scripture and say what does the lord say about these things Anyways, Lord, we just pray that at the end of our time here, we would go away more in love with you, more convinced that you are able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine according to your power that works within us, in our marriages, and in every other facet of our life. Anyways, we just welcome you here now, and we praise you for this time. Thank you for everybody who's present with us, and just minister here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, guys, I, I tell you what, Janice and I... Um, as, as it was mentioned maybe before, for about 13 years, we've had the real privilege of ministering to young newlywed couples, people that have been married a year or less or two years or less. And it has been absolutely a joy to work alongside of our dear friend Blanche Tadlock. And this year, at this time, we would be scheduled to do our newlywed retreat. Yeah. And it didn't happen. Whose idea was this? Which one? This. This was his idea. And um, to be honest with you guys, I'm a little intimidated. I'm not, we haven't really ever done this before. So um, I appreciate your grace and I'm super excited, but this is um, You're awesome. the following entrepreneur who has great ideas. So I'm in it to win it today. <laughs> She's a gift. And, and again, guys, we just thought we'd broaden the conversation today and, and welcome you, those of you who are newlyweds. I know my daughter's on the call. I just saw her and Adam. They've been married uh, a little over a year. They had their first child, uh, what, two months ago. Mm -hmm. But um, we know people on this call that have been married 54 years at least, because I see my parents on the call. And, uh, and then we probably have everything in between. I want to tell you, we're going to be coming straight from here. Mm -hmm. um, we really know there's a lot of worldly wisdom out there. There's a lot of um, experts. There's a lot of psychologists, all these people that speak to marriage. But we are convinced through just our own 26 years of being in this process of being married and figuring out what it is to be a husband and a wife and how to live in intimacy and oneness. And we're just go back time and time again to God's word. And he speaks to the issues that, that we face in our life. And he speaks to them so perfectly and so timely. And so today we just want you to know that that's where we're coming from. This is a biblical perspective. We're convinced that God's the creator of male and female awesomeness. Mm -hmm. I love being male. I love that she's female. I love that we get to be male and female mm -hmm. together in this wonderful relationship. And it's something that God masterfully designed. So guys, you know the beginnings in Genesis. It, it's exactly that. God said, I created them to be male and female. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And he made them in God's image. He made us to glorify him. And then he said, you know what? This whole thing of guys being alone, a man being alone, it's not good. Genesis 2, he talks about that, and he starts laying out through Scripture that, hey, you know what? He needs a help. And guys, I don't know about you, but I need help. I need all kinds of help. And I'm not joking. I'm not being facetious. I'm dead serious. I, was, I, I did okay being alone, single, but I'll tell you what. God knew how much I needed a help in Janice and how much I need her today. And in Genesis 2, he lays out that beautiful picture of, hey, here's this woman, and, and now you're going to leave your father and your mother. You're going to cleave to your wife and you two are going to become one. And guys, if there's a goal in marriage, in our marriage, mm -hmm. it's that. We want to be one. We just want to be tight. We want to be united. We don't want to be isolated. We don't want to be distant. We don't want to be far from one another in any way. Mm -hmm. You think about intimacy, physical intimacy, and, and the beauty of that. It's you're one. You're literally occupying the same exact space. And, and it, the Lord wants that for our hearts. He wants that for our uh, spiritually. He wants that for us, yeah, physically. He wants it emotionally. And it's, it's the goal of, I think, a godly Christian marriage. We both grew up in wonderful Christian homes. And yet we came to grips early on, um, personally, of our own great need of a Savior. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter your environment, where you grew up, how much uh, faith was in your home. What a great example you had as a married couple before you by your parents or not. It doesn't matter your background, your upbringing. Every single one of us comes to marriage with this humanity 
this awareness that God made us, and yet there are ways that we just fall so short of his glory. And I'm speaking to believers today. I'm speaking to people who recognize that, hey, I've sinned. I've fallen short of the glory of God. And, uh, and that's a real foundation from where we come because with Christ in us, with the salvation that we have in him, comes all kinds of hope, comes all kinds of life-giving uh, his spirit working in us that works in a beautiful way in our marriage. It scares me to think honestly where I would be in my marriage or where my marriage would be if I wasn't a believer and the Lord wasn't working in my life. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. It's where we start. Yep. It's where we start. And so I want to just start by talking real briefly about um, Janice and I just get a little testimony. We're married 26 years. We'll be married 27 in August, yeah, August 27 15. August and it's been totally perfect we've never had an argument we've never gone through a difficult time we've never had any stress um, <laughs> I, I mean it's what we envisioned when we got married we just said we'd like everything to be perfect everything to be ideal um, we've never why are you laughing no uh -huh. in all seriousness right guys we live in the same world you live in and I'll tell you what it's a messy world and there's all kinds of challenges that come at us. But some of the things we want to share this morning are going to come from just being what we call in the trenches. Okay. We live here. We have children. Uh, we've been blessed with 11. Um, you know, I like to say one takes all your time and takes all your concern and all your heart. And 11 does the same thing. It demands more than we have. And we have to find ourselves on our knees before our Heavenly Father daily for these, for these things. We've been blessed with two of our children now being married. That's another whole delight. Mm -hmm. Isn't it beautiful? That's awesome. Love it. She's a grandma. Yeah, four I'm married, times. I'm married to a grandma. Four times. Grandma. I don't feel like a granny, but hey, I guess I am. <laughs> whatever granny's doing, I'm in. I mean, granny's beautiful. Granny works. I'm a grandpa. It's weird stuff, but <laughs> it happens, you know? Anyways, and it's beautiful. Over time, God just continues to unfold his blessing. I want to speak to a moment real quick about vision, and then we're going to look at some of the questions you guys have put to us. Scripture lays out a beautiful vision for marriage. I've heard books come out recently that, you know, marriage is designed to, to make us holy. And I go, that's not why I was designed. If you read Genesis, God made marriage because he says, man is no good alone and he's a lonely dude and he's not going to be who I created him to be without a lover, without a soulmate, without a companion, without somebody to go through life, sharing it with him and bringing her strengths and her, in his weaknesses and vice versa. God said he actually created marriage for companionship. He did for a soulmate, for somebody who just, and I think it, it's super important. Yes, marriage can help drive us to the Lord and it can refine us and it can help make us better, but he didn't design it to make us holy in, in, in the core sense of it. He made it because he says, hey, a man isn't going to do well by himself and he needs this union. He needs this partnership. He needs this beautiful friendship, this companion. And so oneness, again, is the goal. There's a vision I think that's important for marriage. And I don't know what your vision is. Have you taken time to sit down and write out, husbands, what do you want from your marriage? What's the thing that God has called you to in, in your marriage? Wives, have you sat down and written down? What are those things that you want to, that you want to see in your marriage? And, and I want to just encourage you because if without vision, scripture says, the people perish, right? Without vision, people perish. And guess what? Without vision, marriages perish. They don't go anywhere. All right? And so here's, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Look through scripture and get an example if you haven't done this. And many of you have, I'm sure. Some of my vision verses, Psalm 127 and 128. Years ago, before I was ever married, the Lord laid these verses on my heart. And I'm going to put on my glasses because I am an official Grandpa. Grandfather, <laughs> all right? And Psalm 127, I want to read this, these verses, even though they're probably familiar to you. And these have been vision verses for me for many years. It says here, Psalm 127. Sorry. It sure does. Except the Lord build a house. They labor in vain that build mm -hmm. it. Guys, if we're trying to do this on our own strength, our own wisdom, our own willpower, you know, it's going to break down. But he says, the Lord builds a house you're going to labor in vain to build it, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake, but in vain. It is vain to you rise up early 
and sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. He says, as arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man. It doesn't say happy a lot in scripture, but this is one area where he just goes, man, happy is that man who's, who hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed when they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord and walketh in his ways. For you shall eat the labor of your hands and happy shalt thou be. It shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. It says, behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. Yea, and it says, thou shalt and shall see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children. Here's the deal. Guys, a vision of God building a house, a God building a marriage, a God building a relationship that is life-giving. Life-giving not only to one another, but to your offspring and to the people that he's put in your world, the body of Christ, the people he's put around you. It's a beautiful thing. Psalm 1 talks about, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth the way of the sinners, or sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. Not a tree that's shriveled up and dead and struggling and just trying to survive. No, you'll be like a tree. And I, I, I just see our marriage is being like this tree. Our marriage is being like a tree that at least doesn't wither. If, what does it say? Whatsoever you do, doth prosper. Yes, whatsoever it, it does, it prospers. I believe that God wants to flourish our marriages mm -hmm. like a, a beautiful tree that brings forth life, that bears fruit of all kinds. This doesn't mean that, you, that you're, the fruitfulness is measured by the number of children you have. It, God can make you fruitful in so many different ways right? But the fruitfulness is a, a marriage that's life-giving and is able to spring forth life to others. And having a vision of your marriage being a vessel or a vehicle that God uses to minister to others, to refresh you and to bless others is a beautiful thing. So we're talking vision here. Deuteronomy 28, I'm not going to go through it, 1 through 14. Read it sometime. He lays out this vision. He says, hey, if you're going to walk in my ways, if you're going to do what I lay out in my word for you, you're going to be blessed everything you put your hand to do, starting with your marriage, yes, but everything you touch in the field, in the city, with your children, with your, with your work, with your labor. Anyways, those are some vision verses I have for marriage that God has us not surviving, but thriving and flourishing is a life-giving uh, marriage as a testimony. Scripture in Ephesians 5 says so clearly that the bride of Christ, us, and his relationship with us is this picture. Marriage is that picture. And guys, the world's crying out for us to be those kinds of marriages right where we're at. So anyways, today, I just pray that wherever you're at in your marriage, that you have a clear vision of what God is going to do this year, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Right. Amen? Amen. And I want to say one last thing. And then I'm going to make, have my wife talk because she has all the wisdom in the world, okay? Anyways, I want to say the, um, I talk a lot in, in, in frameworks because I think if you have a biblical framework for your marriage, you've got a foundation on which to build, a biblical framework. One of the other things I've enjoyed is a framework uh, for prioritization, um, how I prioritize things in, in my life. And that is, I call it my giant five, and it's, if you see it on social media, sometimes I'm sitting there going, I'm the giant five guy. Well, all that really means is I believe that first and foremost, for a marriage to be solid, to be grounded, to have a chance at being all that God created to be, Christ has to be foundational, the center, the epicenter, the one drawing us to himself, flat out. And that means individually. It means Janice and I come to marriage as believers. And we come to marriage as believers who are being filled by the Spirit of God individually in our own individual relationship with Him. If I'm not right with the Lord Jesus Christ, if He's not dwelling in and through me, I immediately break down as I try to love my wife. I do not love my wife as Christ loved the church. I, I fail miserably. On the other hand, if I'm filled with the Spirit of the living God and I'm surrendered to Him in wholeness. My heart is towards him. I'm tender hearted, listening to his word, abiding in him, John 15. And I'm all of a sudden Christ can make me fruitful 
in loving my wife. He can make me love her, as Ephesians 5 says, as Christ loved the church. But short of that, I'm going to break down. And I am the recipient of this woman who wakes up of her love and her relationship with the Lord that is the foundation of who she is. Denise, you start every day. Yeah. Not with me. Some days with me. Depends if I get her before she gets out of bed, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes she gets up and out. She escapes before I get her. And she spends time in the Word, in, the word, yeah. in prayer, okay? And so when I talk about Giant Five, my relationship or our relationship with the Lord comes first in our relationship. The next relationship that's prioritized in our life is our marriage. There's no other relationship outside of my individual and her individual relationship with the Lord that takes precedence than over our marriage. Our marriage is our number two priority in life. Mm -hmm. not, not just in family dealings or in, no, our number two priority in life is after our relationship with the Lord and maintaining that intimacy with him and fellowship is maintaining intimacy and closeness with each other, period. There's nothing else that's going to interfere. And yeah, there's seasons of time where we've gotten those out of whack. Believe me. Oh, there's days, right? Where I go, hoo, 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 hoo. back to the priorities. Mm -hmm. Lord, where am I with you? Okay. I need to get right. Okay. Lord, where am I with her? Where are we? But that's number two. Mm -hmm. Guys, this next point is foundational too. If you have children, raise your hand if you've got a child or two or three or 10. Okay. Tons of kids out there. I love it. If you have a child, it is so easy for parents and marriages to all of a sudden kind of compromise priorities. Our children come third. Our relationship with Lord first, our relationship with the other, each other comes second. Our children come third. They know they're important to us. We adore them. We want so muchly to see them thrive and be all that God created them to be. But they are third and they're separate from our marriage. Our marriage is going to last the test of time. Our kids are going to grow up and marry other people, Lord willing, and have babies and responsibilities and things of their own. They're going to be doing their own life. They're going to be like, oh, man, I love my parents, but, man, I'm in the trenches. And guess what? We're going to be left with each other. And we get people who call us, and they go, man, our kids are all out of the nest. They're all gone, and we don't know who we are. Guys, priorities, you get to choose what they are. It's critical you're clear on them and that you don't just kind of abstractly think, oh, they'll be okay. Third is our children. For us, we manage our health because we want to steward God's temple, what he gave us. That's number four. Number five is our work, career, job, whatever. And I won't go into all the details, but it's using your God-given gifts to earn, to serve, to serve and I'm going to say minister. Guys, I, I really spend a moment here on these priorities because if these priorities get out of whack, I can't tell you how many people I know that ministry – they think is number one. They think that goes with relationship with the Lord. It doesn't. Guys, if your ministry is over, above your marriage, you, your ministry will fall apart. Mm -hmm. Ministry comes after your responsibility. And this is so clear in Timothy. He lays it out so clearly in those chapters that for us to be effective ministers, men and women, we need to be effective in our home and seeing those areas thrive. So if my work becomes my priority, I coach a lot of business owners. They come into these workshops and they're wanting to grow their businesses. And I sit there and I tell them my priorities. I tell them, hey, you might've come to the wrong coach because guess what? Business is number five on my list of priorities in my life. First is my relationship with Lord. Next is gonna be my wife, then our children, then taking care of the, stewarding the body that God gave me so I can be what he's created me to be. And then it's my priority turns to work and the ministry and all of these things. I spend some time here, guys, because I hear so many people elevating work, okay? I literally was on a plane not long ago from LA to Bend, Oregon, and a guy told me he was coming up to visit his wife and kids, and he left his wife and kids here because they got divorced because he said, I spent 18 years building this business. There was no way I was gonna let it, I was gonna let it fall down, and it required more of me. So he sacrificed his family for his business, and he told me right there, his number one priority is what it is. And, and, it, and we choose the consequences of it. So guys, I don't know what your giant five are, but I pray today that you would sit down together after this call and say, hey, what are our five most important priorities in life? 
Because as you go through the tempestuous, the temp, the tempests and the storms of life, and we all have them, you're going to be tested. And if you don't have a framework to, hey, where are we? A way of going back to the basics, of going back to a grounding point. It's very difficult to keep all the, the plates spinning and do life the way uh, I think at the end brings a fruitfulness that you want. So the giant five that I shared with you, I don't know what yours are, but you should be really clear on them because it, it again serves as a reminder to us um, how to readjust or reprioritize in our relationship. Okay. So again, guys, having a vision, having a framework, and then just again, realize that there are no perfect marriages. Okay. Guys, I'm telling you what, there's only marriages that are in the trenches, you know, making progress moment by moment. And I want to challenge you right now with a question on a scale of one to 10. And I asked this question a lot of Janice. She asked it of me. I asked her last night. I'll tell you what she said. She'll tell you what she said in a minute. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being uh, where we were when we were on a cruise in February. 10 is we're 10 days in the Caribbean, 3,500 3, staff on the ship serving us, wonderful godly messages being preached to us all day long on marriage and intimacy and oneness and meeting so many Christian couples and fun, unlimited food and buffets, scuba diving. I mean, you know, sex, like you can't even believe it. I mean, can I say that? Yeah, I can say that. You know, just this time we're going, it's a 10, baby. And here's the thing. I think a lot of us come to marriage and we go, I want to get on the love boat, right? And I want to sail all the way through my life on the love boat. And guess what? Tens are awesome. But tens are these little peak moments here and there along the way. And we live really on other places on that scale. And I asked Janice last night, because I always do before we share anything on marriage, where are we? And you said? I said a six. Six. And guess what? Six is not good on a scale of one to 10. Six is not like, I don't like six. Okay. I, I don't like six at all. Now six is better than two. Okay. I've gotten a lot of twos. Two is my wife's code language for we're doing terrible. Okay. I've learned that one, she won't stoop so low as to give me a one or a zero, but two is like, Hey, you still have some life in you, but you're just, it's an epic fail. Right. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. And, and I, I want to encourage you because I don't care where you are on that scale of one to 10. It's super important to know. Hey, I think it's super important to let them know we went from a six to an eight or nine in a simple conversation because we had to decide why are you at a six? And we got to talk about it. Hey, I know we have a lot going on. I know you're not being intentional about it, but I just don't feel very pursued right now. I, you've got this, this, and this. He's, he's got a full plate. I understand that. And so, you know what? You can move up really fast. All it takes is a little conversation. And we felt so close. I was at an eight or nine within 30 minutes. So that's the good part. It is a good part. And it's not always that easy, just so you know. I mean, sometimes I have to take a few days to move up the scale. And that's okay too, right? It, it, but I think it's important to know, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we ask that question, it removes all the, how are we doing? Oh, we're doing okay. We're doing fine. Guess what? Fine and okay. Ooh, terrible words. They really are. They're so muddy. They're so gray. My fine is so different than her fine. Sometimes I ask her how we're doing. Uh, uh, fine. We're fine. Yeah. How fine is that, right? It's not fine. It's, it's bad. So anyways, use that scale. I want to ask you right now, ask your spouse, turn to them and say, hey, where are we on a scale of one to 10 right now? Just shoot me straight. And guys and girls, ladies, please listen to me. Take whatever they give you as a gift. Whatever my wife tells me in that number is a gift. When she's told me it's two, it's a gift. Because I know that, hey, she's not feeling real close to me. And I have some, some paying attention to do. I need to listen. I need to key in. I'm not, I'm missing something. Whatever she says is a gift. Whatever he says is a gift. And take it as that. Don't ever take offense at the number given. I mean, you can be surprised like, oh, wow, <laughs> I am often. She's like, oh, we're a four. I'm like, what? I thought we were a nine. You know, I wasn't even close. Okay, well, thank you. Now that I know I'm a four, what's one thing I can do to move us closer to a, a better number? I don't even tell her, well, what do I need to do to get to a 10? No, I just want to go from four to 4.3. Okay, I'm good with progress. Just a little bit better. And she'll tell me. Sometimes it's 
what are some of the things you've told me when we're, we're not doing good? You know, and it's like a low number. And I go, what do we need? You know, what do you, oh, what do you it could be anything from, I just need time to myself. Get um, what she said. She needs less of me to like, like me better. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I mean, but it's the truth sometimes for our marriage. She's like, I just need a spell. Yeah. What else? Or it could be, um, I don't know why. I just need to be held and I just cry and he just holds me. Okay. Sometimes I don't know why, but it could be a thousand different reasons, you know, thousand different reasons. We have a lot of questions to go through, so I'm not going to share yeah. those ideas. <laughs> don't, don't give away the gold yet. No, but it is, it's, it, it's always buried. And that's why I quit guessing as a husband. I found it's much easier to be a hero husband. If she tells me what's going on, like what's the problem or what she needs. Cause guess what? In the past, if I said, Oh, she's at a two, Oh, she must want me to really spend a lot of time with her. She must really want me to really, you know, and often it's like, no, I just need a break from you, the kids. I need to go spend four hours by myself. I need to just pray. I need time. Oh, you get it, right? Okay, so here's the deal. One to 10, where are we? It's always a gift to hear the answer because it lets you know where you are because it's always about progress, not perfection. You're always going to be up and down that scale. The goal for us is to live in the seven, eight, nine sweet spot. Notice six was not there, right? But seven, eight, nine is that little sweet spot where we want to abide. It's where we want to dwell because that's a really healthy place for us to be. And, uh, and we've been all over. You want to tell them the lowest number you ever gave me? Negative 200. Yeah. You heard right. Yeah. Negative 200. It's not on the scale. It's like really, really, really bad. In fact, I was like, oh my word, what's that even mean? Did that like break us? Here's what I just wanted to get his attention. <laughs> she had it, right? <laughs> she had my attention. Um, I just tell her, no, I won't go there. So she, she's got my attention, but that was, yeah. guess what? Here's what's interesting. I was not fearful. I was not, oh my word, we're, we're destined to failure. We're at a negative 200 on a scale of one to 10. I heard her heart. And I go, man, I've hurt her. Man, I'm in a bad place with her. Man, I have not handled myself or let, or I haven't been the man God wants me to be in this relationship. Janice, what do I need to do to move us forward towards oneness, back towards something, back towards negative 199, okay? What is it? And she gave me those answers. So guys, this is really useful. And I, I pray that you'll use this often in your relationship and, and don't use it when you're just upset but feel free to use it when you're upset. Do it when you're doing good. Do it all the time. Just test. It's like taking your temperature. Okay. So a little framework for some stuff around marriage, guys. Um, we're going to look at a couple of your questions. Guys, we got all kinds of fun questions and they're all over the place. Um, I mean, really fun questions. So Janice, what's, what's one of the first ones that uh, kind of came to us? Okay. Before I go into our first question, I just really wanted to preface what Chad said. He said, we want to thrive in our marriage, right? We don't want to just survive. And if I were to ask all of you on the call today, who wants to thrive in their marriage, everybody would raise their hand. So that's the 30,000 foot view. But how do you do that, right? The practical little tidbit ideas, those are the, the things that we want to get to um, that will help us with this. The Bible says, um, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. Okay. The Lord has given you victory in every situation. I don't care if it's with children. I don't care if it's working through um, spousal disagreement. The Lord has given you victory. He said, you're more than a conqueror. Amen. You're an overcomer. This is who you are. You are Peter. He wants you to walk on water. He wants you to walk above your circumstances in a supernatural way that is filled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's who you are. When you're saved, you have Christ and he is your life. Okay. So um, don't be surprised when you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And um, so anyway, the first- Could I share one other verse that goes sure. with that? The second Peter came to mind verses one through four guys, some of the best scripture in the entire Bible are contained there. And he says, he's given us all things given us as a gift, all things that pertain to life and godliness in Christ Jesus through the knowledge of him who's called us to glory and virtue. Mm -hmm. He's given it. It's a gift and we get to receive it. Mm -hmm. Anyways, keep on. That's What's right. that first question? Okay. So the first question is, I have to wear glasses too. Sorry. 
Okay, so what is your decision making process? Please talk. Yeah, what's your decision making process and how do you come with an agreement when both spouses think completely the opposite? Okay, we can all relate to that. Um, first, I just wanted to say when I was first married, or I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, I always have Chad in mind when I'm making decisions, when I'm at the grocery store, when I'm buying clothes for the kids, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm always thinking, okay, so what would Chad think about this? Because like he said, oneness is the goal and I want to be on the same page. I don't want to bring, you know, a dumb, you know, silly example of this is that he doesn't like writing all over the kids clothes he just wants plain color shirts okay so that's really simple so i'm out shopping i'm like oh i can't find any it's really hard to find just plain colored shirts you know um but i'm even with that simple little decision i'm thinking with chad in mind um in the early days if i spent anything over a hundred dollars we didn't have much money and so we would talk to each other about that um we develop some verbiage in our relationship consult before you commit you might want to write that down because Good it one. has served us very well consult before you commit chad has a huge yes button and i was having trouble because he was just saying hey you know inviting everybody over yeah come to my house and i was like um i've got six kids i'm a homeschooling them the kids are wiped out like we need to talk about this and um so anyway, there was a, there were some hurt feelings through that, but we had to sit down and talk about it, create verbiage around it. And he said, what can I do to make this better? And he's the one who came up with consult before I commit. And so I'll always say, Hey, if something comes my way, I'll just say, let me talk to chat about it and I'll get back with you. That's you're always safe. If you do that. Um, so, so those are some of the things that are for like lighter issues, but you can develop some more serious issues. Like he came up to me and he said, I'm thinking we ought to take all of our kids down to San Clemente for six weeks. And then we'll go to Tahoe for six weeks and ski. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, what about the kids school? They need to have discipline. So I'm like the really grounded person in a relationship that's just like beats the drum and does the routine, you know, and he's just like, woo, spontaneous party guy, you know, and it really kind of shook my world. And I was like, okay, first of all, I'm a internal processor. So, and he's a verbal processor. So when he says something, he just lets it all out. And then I need to go away and just think about it for a little bit. And so I go away and I'm like, what do I do with this? Okay. Um, he's the head of our home and you know, Lord, how do I deal with this? So we talk about it. We talk about a lot of things. I always bring up all the objections. Well, what about this? And what about this? And I would need this to do that and whatever. But you know, so many times when I've learned to trust my husband and just go with it, after we're on, we get on the same page, first of all, um, then it turned, it was awesome. I realized I didn't have anybody pulling at my kids. We we were sharing fun experiences together. They did great in their homeschooling. And I was like, honey, you're so brilliant. That was a blast. Not always. <laughs> Let's do it next year. Um, but I'll get even deeper. Okay. So we had some success there. I yielded to that. But then he came to me and said, okay, I want to put my house up for rent for six months. And I want to travel to 17 resorts and go, we're, we're going to be called the big ski family. And we're going to go from resort to resort and ski. Won't that be awesome? And I'm like, sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> I'm thinking logistically in and out of places, ski gear, boots, cold. I'm a warm person. I I like, I'm a fair weather skier, you know, and I'm sitting there going six hours in ski boots, like every day for three and a half months. And so things like that took a lot more talking. I'm like, okay, you just rock my world. I need to go think about this and pray about this. So my feelings still didn't change. What do you do when you're, when you are totally opposed to what your husband is doing right mm. and i just kept praying about it 
And um, the Lord just kept bringing me back to Ephesians 5. Okay, so Ephesians 5, 17, and then I'm going to jump to verse 22. It says, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You know, I had to search my soul. I'm like, how do I know what the will of God's fam is for our family, right? I need to um, be open to other things, thinking a different way, thinking outside the box. And then it goes on to say, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. He, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so, you know what? I just, every time I went to pray about it, it was like the Lord was taking me back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. I'm like, okay, Lord, if this is what you want us to do, then I'm going to jump on board. Before I did that, I went to him one last time and I said, honey, on a scale from one to 10, how important is this to you? And he said, a 10. No question about it. 10, hundred percent. And I'm like, okay. You know, so in a marriage relationship, one person has to make the decision at the end. And the Lord has put the husband in that place. And so I, it says as unto the Lord. So when I submit and I yield my will to my husband, first of all, it's the most attractive. You are the most attractive to your spouse is when you are honoring him and respecting him and yielding to him. And second of all, I just went to the Lord and I said, Lord, okay, this is your deal. I'm submitting to you as unto the Lord. Okay. And so you've got me. I just pray that you give me a love for skiing. You could do that. So could you just like change my heart and help me just to get on full board and let's go. And so we did that. And you guys, we had a really great experience for three and a half months. We went to different resorts. We worked out some things that I needed. I needed longer periods of time in one house, like three weeks, and then visit the resorts from there. But the Lord did a really neat thing. First of all, he worked in my heart and help me to yield it and to surrender it to him. And I just said, Lord, you see this, you understand. And he was doing a work in me. And, um, and it turned out to be a really good thing. And so um, those are just a few of my suggestions. I, I love it, Janice. Again, I would love to, to say that in our decision-making, guys, she just said some incredibly beautiful things in the sense that she, she honors and respects me, even though she knows how dishonorable or unrespectable I can be at times. It's something that she graciously, through the power of God, gives me, though it's far undeserved. I just want you to understand that. She doesn't do that because, oh yeah, Chad is so worthy. It's not. Um, just as Christ in that same passage tells us as husbands, hey, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, it, it's this calling that's above us. It's, a, it's beyond our abilities. And yet in his supernatural grace, I believe he provides that provision. When we come to decision making, I am, I am not only reticent, I, am, I will not make a big decision without getting with Janice. She has a perspective and a wisdom that God has given her that is so critical to me, uh, make us making good, wise decisions. This is not as she said, the buck stops here. She definitely at the end of the day says, Chad, it's your call. But when we get to that point where it's my call, we have prayed together. We have talked through things. We have asked, answered questions and know this, if Janice wasn't on board and didn't have a piece with this thing, even though I was at a 10 in my own desire, my own confidence that this could be great for our family. If she wasn't ready and didn't feel like she could embrace that, we wouldn't have gone. I, scripture tells me that I'm to live with my wife in an understanding way. That, that's loving her. That's nourishing her and cherishing her. If you can find, defines love as that. And so it would be wrong of me to sit there and say, well, God put me in this position to make a decision. I just want what I want. No, God has given us this responsibility to be in submission to him and to seek him for his, his, uh, his will in the biggest decisions that we make. 
do we buy this home? Do we sell it? Do we move here? Do we take this job? Do you know, what do we do with this child that's going through this challenging time? What do we do with this, this daughter who's dating this guy that you're praying about? And I mean, all these things that you're faced with every day. It's, it's such a beautiful thing if your decision making can actually draw you closer. And I believe that's what those decisions are for. They're actually to draw you to one another in expectation on the Lord that he's going to bring uni unity and he's going to bring clarity to you. And at the end of the day, Janice did lay out. If we prayed about it, we thought, talked about it, we've received good counsel, as Proverbs says, you know, to go seek people who have wisdom. If we've cried out, as James 1, 5 says, and said, Lord, give us your wisdom, then we take and we make that step. And at the end of the day, I am responsible for the decisions we make for our family. But it's a unifying process done right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be contentious. And it doesn't mean we don't have our debates. Boy, do we have debates. She can bring up the best reasons why something should or should not happen. And it's, again, perspective I need so tremendously in my life. So anyways. So a lot, another, a, no. another tidbit on that is that um, I asked myself the question, would I rather be right or would I rather have relationship? So a lot of times it's just, I want the relationship. And so there's a process there too. Amen. And then also your children are watching you. My children know how I'm made. They know, they see, and they, I am setting the temperature for my home. Is he, am I respecting my husband? Am I submitting to them? I am modeling what I want them to do for their husbands. And they are in turn living this out and watching how the whole picture unfolds. They got the whole picture. And it's interesting, before we got married, this section of scripture was really important to Chad. Here, I, I didn't get married until I was 26. I'm just this independent girl. My par parents were like, yeah, whatever. I'm just kind of living on my own and doing my own thing. And Chad wanted to have these words in our ceremony. And I'm like, of course I'm going to submit to you. Like, we don't have to like read that and get into that. Like, it just sounds so male chauvinistic. And, and he's like, no, he's like, I can't marry you unless we are on the same page in this area. And you know what? When we sign up to get married, we decide that the final word is with our husbands. And so if we don't want that, then we shouldn't have signed up for it, you know? But the benefits, if you want the blessing of the Lord on your marriage and in your life, do it God's way. And it's God's way is like the upside down kingdom. It's just a paradox. If you want to be great, serve. If you want to find your life, give it up. Everything is backwards to what you think it's supposed to be. And so we got to get used to that. And usually I've learned to just train my mind. Hey, if it's, I'm too scared to do something. It's probably something the Lord wants me to do. You know, it's just all upside down. And then another verse that I go to when I, when I really want the Lord to change Chad's heart, I'll pray uh, Proverbs 21.1. Ladies, write it down. Proverbs 21.1. <laughs> the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he will. So if I really feel like, I'm like, Lord, first of all, you pray, would you please change Chad's heart? And if his, chat, if his heart doesn't change, then I'm going to go with it. But I do pray. And the, sometimes the Lord has, has changed Chad's heart to a different um, uh, point of view. So um, there are times too when, you know, he's made a bad decision according to you oh plenty of times you know okay so he wanted to buy <laughs> this once. car that was just when we were first married we did not have the money he had his reasons for why he wanted it he was a i was a financial advisor i needed to look like i had money he Isn't needed to look yeah. cool okay yeah. whatever <laughs> i'm gonna go see the client so we went out and brought this brand new expedition we, <sighs> call, we called it too bloom and expensive it was the tbe our kids even called it that okay and I said, Chad, you're going to, this is my vote. I really don't think we should get it. We had a beater van and, you know, I could understand why he felt all the way he did, but to me, it wasn't worth going into debt. I don't think we should do that. And he's just like, he didn't change his mind and he went and bought it. And like two weeks later, he is sitting in our garage, like wanting to cry. $600 payment every month on this blasted car 
that is parked underneath the parking structure of the building for most of the year, okay? He never even used his car. People see his car, you know? Anyway, but hopefully I didn't say I told you so. She didn't. Hopefully. I think I might have, but you sure didn't. But ladies, so what, much I, grace. what I want to say to you is that sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Your husband is never going to make 100% the right decisions all the time. Yeah. You are not going to make your decisions 100% right all the time. And this is where we extend grace. Grace is so important. Hey, it's okay. And you know what? Uh, I, I heard um, a guy talk about this one time. He said, if you want to honor your husband, let him fail. Let him make his decisions and let life teach him. Okay. You don't have to be the Holy spirit and you don't have to teach your husband everything. You just go to your prayer closet and you just pray and you just love on your husband and you just see the way it turns out. Turns out. Yeah. Turns out it works. Yep. I'll tell you what, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. This whole Ephesians five passage, which speaks so clearly to marriage guys, it has such a piece in it for us too. And I know that Janice, she does such a good job, I believe, of taking that woman's role, a biblical role of a wife and saying, hey, this is what I've embraced. And she lives it every day. For us as, as men, God, again, has called us to this standard of loving our wives as Christ loved the church, sacrificially surrendering to the submission to the headship of Christ. He lays it out so clearly. And I know that Janice has no issues with me, my headship, my decisions, any of it, if I'm surrender to the Lord. And if I'm immersed in his word, if I'm filled with his spirit, there's just a grace and a blessing that brings about this. I believe it's the mystery of the gospel. I really do. It's the mystery of the gospel made manifest in a husband and wife when we're surrendered to him in those right ways. And again, just a joy to see, but it affects every area of our lives, decision-making, et cetera. I have, there's another question here that came up, Janice. Yeah. And it said, um, what, uh, right here, how do you keep your marriage strong after you have this first child, right? This, yeah. How do you, you have children? What do you do to, to, to kind of keep your marriage front and center? And I want to just say a couple things. First of all, realize that if your priorities are my relationship with the Lord, when you have a child, yes, they need to be fed every three hours or whatever it is. They need to be, you know, uh, diapers need to be changed. The realities of caring for a little one are immediately, you know, to overtake your schedule. Your life gets very disrupted. Your relationship with the Lord still must be the priority and finding ways to spend that, to connect with the Lord. And I want to speak to that real quick. There's a lot of emphasis on men being spiritual leaders. And it's kind of sometimes built up as this, well, a spiritual leader in their home will, you know, get up every morning at 5 a.m. 5 5 while it's still dark and go to some corner with their journal and will write really wise insights that they glean from deep study every morning that they will then sit down throughout the day and minister to their wives wife let me teach you what these profound things i've learned from scripture and then family gather around and i will impart to you the wisdom of the ages from a biblical you know and they and men get intimidated with this role of hey spiritual headship leadership and i want you to tell you spiritual leadership is us as men getting on our knees every morning just saying lord here i am and that maybe it's not even getting on your knees. Maybe it's putting on your running shows like I like to do and hit the trail and to praise him and thank him in the morning and to spend time renewing my mind with some of the verses that I've memorized over the years and just meditate on his promises. Maybe it's me just casting all my cares upon him because he cares so much for me and praying for my wife or my children. And I don't do that every day. I don't do it perfectly. I don't do any of this perfectly. And yet my heart is towards the Lord. My heart is, is leaning towards him. When I get in a bind, boy, do I hit my knees. Boy, do I search out scripture. Boy, do I go to godly men in my life and say, hey, brother, I don't know what I'm dealing with. I called a guy this week and I said, hey, I'm a father of a daughter who's got relationships with a guy. Uh, I want some counsel. You know, I'll call my parents. Hey, talk to me. Get, speak into my life. Uh, a spiritual leader is someone who's hungry in their own heart after the Lord in, in a simple way. It is not the guy who, who must have an hour of devoted time or a mother that must, with busy children, spend an hour of Bible study every day. We've never once ever in the history of our marriage gone through a devotional together. 
I hate to drop it to you guys. We aren't like waking up every day and like, okay, let's have a little time. Guess what? Our lives are crazy chaotic at times. I'm up at four in the morning catching a plane. She's over in the, getting a little Bible time, refreshing her soul before the kids come up and, and the games begin. Life is happening. But all throughout the day, our hearts are towards him. We're praising him. We're thanking him. We're bringing, yes, we'll get out. Uh, guys, you can get out your Bibles and read Proverbs over breakfast to your family and just let your kids fill in the blank or guess what the words are. Keep it age specific. I mean, and then just ask questions. And, and that's spiritual leadership. It's, it's maybe reading a chapter, you know, before you go to bed and, and reading around, let each of the kids read and say, hey, what does that verse mean to you, 12-year-old son or 15-year-old daughter? Share with us. It's at breakfast, you know, Janice sharing when I'm not there, just saying, hey, this is what the Lord showed me in my quiet time. He, he brought me this verse. And, and what do you think it means? It's taking God's word, Deut Deuteronomy 6. He says, we are to teach these precepts diligently not in some formal, structured, crazy, organized, theologically systematic way, but just as you rise up, as you sit down, as you go along the way, are our children, are our wives, are our husbands seeing us as men and women that our hearts are towards the Lord, that we're receiving his word, that we're looking to him for our wisdom, for our strength. So spiritual leadership can show up in so many ways. And, and I just want to encourage you that it is not a formulaic, oh, you must check this box, check that box. Let that burden be gone and walk in the grace that God's given you and just chase after the Lord in the way that you, you know him best and learn from him in his word. Some people literally will learn best moving, listening to scripture on, on, an, on, a, on a headset while they go for a walk. Some, yes, are going to deep dive and, and listen to deep studies and whatever. Be who you are and, and know that God is meeting you where you're at, and he's going to minister to you in that way. But this whole point of when you have young children, guys, mm -hmm. your priorities don't change. You still must stay connected to the vine, abide in Christ, look to him for your strength. How does that take shape in this new environment? Second, keep your marriage a priority. Yes, even with a newly born baby. Still love on one another. Still figure out ways to connect and be intentional towards one another. Third, take care of the little needs of the little babies. And, you know, you get one or two or three. And, I mean, it, it just it starts to get complex at times. But slow down and say, hey, what do I need to remove from my life so that my priorities can be aligned with what are truly important to me? Don't let church work or busyness take you away from too many of the things that are, you're called to in your home. Guys, other, other people putting demands on your time. Keep your priorities in line. And, and I just, anyways, anything practical for a young mama oh, yeah. um, with young children? Um, I, okay, so my daughter and son-in-law, Katie and Elisha Votberg, put out an excellent resource that I want to share with you. It's called After the Baby for Him and After the Baby for Her. And you can get that on Amazon but it's a workbook that you go through and it talks, you do it before you have your baby and you talk through like all the expectations. They have a workbook that goes with it. Anyway, she gave it to me to read, to see what I would add to it. And I said, Katie, this is an excellent resource. She I said, we're going to have a couple more kids now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm all for it. Anyway. Um, so that's an excellent resource. Um, the first thing I would say is second thing I would say is take care of yourself. Um, it's all about managing your energy and prioritizing. Life is all about energy. And so you got to learn to uh, manage it. So um, you have to readjust to the new normal. I'm thinking of Kyla right now. She, her baby is six weeks old and she's just like, mommy, how do you do this? Like I'm sleep deprived. I'm, you know, how do you keep relationship with daddy and you know, all these things. But I would say readjust to a new normal. You've got to lower your expectations. My, you know, um, and the father needs to take the baby every once in a while. Um, and that's part of us explaining our needs to our husband. I remember Chad, he said, what can I do for you? I'm like, honey, I just need time to myself. He's like, okay, I'm taking all the kids, the infant, okay? A nursing baby. He goes, you're gonna have the whole day you can go wherever you want, do whatever you want. Here's some money for taking yourself out to eat. I'm going to drive the baby to you. You're going to nurse the baby. And wherever you are, you just call me and let me know. And I'm just going to bring that baby and take him away. And I had like a whole 12 hours to myself. It was awesome. So I'm just putting that out there to you guys. 
you really want to, you know, score high with your wife. You want to be a 10 on a scale from one to 10. And if you've got a new baby, you can do that. Okay. Um, sleep when the baby sleeps. It's a real temptation to overdo and, or to just let social media gobble up your time. Cause time can fly when you're just like, Oh, I just need a veg, you know, probably what you need to do is go to sleep so that you have some energy when your husband comes home. Um, and if you have trouble with social media, set a timer. I'm just going to look through my stuff. I have 15 minutes. That's it. And then, um, so you're taking charge of yourself. Um, the other thing is this sounds really basic, but it's really easy to neglect the basics. It's really just feeding yourself good food. I know that I just be about everybody else. Oh, the kids need food. My husband needs food. And I just like totally neglect myself. And that's not good. You are a priority. You need to take care of yourself. When you're on an airplane, they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself and then put it on your child. So you can't help other people if you're not taking care of yourself first. Um, I exercise. Um, that really helps. Um, and sometimes as Chad was talking about being in the word, having a three by five card. Sometimes I was so tired from being up in the night, write a verse on a three by five card and just put it in front of your sink. The Lord is my shepherd. And just meditate on, I shall not want. Lord, thank you that you're my shepherd. You see me. That makes me want to cry right now because there were so many times when that's all I could do. And so I know there's a lot of mommies out there that can relate to me. So um, anyway, take guilt-free days too. So. So good. Yeah. So good. All right. I don't know why it's always so dear when, I don't like it when you cry, but it's really dear when you cry. Anyways, <laughs> don't cry too much. Thank you. Uh, guys, here's the deal. It's already been an hour and so appreciate you again being on this call. We're going to take a four minute break. Stand up, stretch, go see a man, you know, bio break, whatever, and then come right back in four minutes. And we're going to talk about intimacy. I thought, I mean, at least some of the guys will be back. Anyways, we'll see you in four minutes. Like we're uh, oh, wow. almost there on time. Okay, very good. Let me see what I'm doing. Hold on. Go here. Okay, so here's the deal. I, uh, I told you, we, we got quite a few questions uh, around the subject of physical intimacy. And uh, it, here's the deal. Oh, wow. I like it. I see uh, Kevin Short and his bride are applying, right? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Applying this stuff first and foremost. I like it. You know, scripture so clearly lays out that, that uh, physical intimacy in a marriage is a gift from God. Okay. And it's, it's been construed in all sorts of ways by the world as having all kinds of, of uh, the world wants to twist what God has made perfect and holy and awesome. And a lot of the questions had to do with, you know, how do you um, uh, have physical intimacy when you had a, now have, a, you know, a child or small children? How do you have physical intimacy be an important and active part of your life when you have older children and they stay up late and, or your house is full and your house is small? And how do you have physical intimacy um, after you've had a child? And the guy's sitting there going, guy, six weeks seems like forever, you know, and yet um, this period of like hands off, you know, what is that? And, and so I, I don't, we aren't going to cover all these things. I would write, recommend a resource um, by Dr. Ed Wheat. It's called Intended for Pleasure. It's a biblical view of physical intimacy for husbands and wives. And guys, this is an important deal. It's a really important deal. It's an extremely important thing for um, both husbands and wives. And I think sometimes this gets misconstrued as, oh, this is a guy thing. You know, guys always want to have sex and women, well, they put up with it and, you know, and whatever. But it's, guys, it's really a big deal. It's part of God's one plan for oneness. And it is a critical component. And I want to tell you this. If there's one thing that I think God's word speaks clearly to around the subject, it's consistency. Mm -hmm. It literally, and meaning that even in Corinthians, it talks so clearly about First Corinthians seven. seven. It talks so clearly about First Corinthians seven. Go look up the verses. He says, don't abstain from being together for, uh, for very long unless you guys are very intentional about it and you pray and you're fasting or whatever, you're taking a serious uh, consideration around it and, you're, and it's only for a season, but otherwise make this an active part of your life. You know, scripture right there in the Garden of Eden, God says, 
you know, hey, they were naked and unashamed. Guys, if you have things that are impacting you intimately that make shame or guilt or any other thing a part of that relationship, address them. Guys, find out the root of what it needs to be forgiven or, or see God's power for freedom in those areas. Get some support and help because we should be able to come to this relationship in a free, open, transparent, uh, just really, really a beautiful, beautiful picture of what the, the oneness that God designed for us. And if there's any constraints around that that impede or block or whatever, I know during our first year of marriage, for whatever reason, intimacy with Jan for Janice, it wasn't all that great. Right. I mean, you know, shocking, but it was, it was pretty rough. She, I mean, she was just like, this is uncomfortable. I don't, I'm not digging this. Right. And then for whatever reason, after our first child, it was like, things got a whole lot better. Um, and there's seasons with intimacy of, of, oh, it's just so great. And then there's times where you're like, hey, you know, your physical fatigue and stress, you know, depression, emotional issues can start to be uh, present in a marriage. And you need to look at those root things. Is it a physical issue? Is it a spiritual issue? Is it emotional issue? And, and don't be afraid to start tackling any one of those areas that's impeding you from having this beautiful freedom and simplicity and joy in, in physical intimacy. So when I say consistency, I just mean that. When you've had a baby and you're six weeks, guys, I don't need to tell you that you don't, it doesn't take intercourse to have physical relationships uh, physical relations with one another. And I'm not going to get all crazy because you don't need me to. And I, and I don't think it's the proper place or time. But my point is this, if a man has a need and a woman is able to be with him in that way, there are ways to bring physical unity and release for one or both. Okay. And, and it, if I, you know, I, I think I've said enough, but my point is, it's important that you're there for one another. Guys, women, this is, I'll ask Janice, what is this Five, um, his needs, her needs. What's uh, physical intimacy for a guy? Uh, what number is it okay. in the five? Um, I think it's number two after it's, respect. It's not, it's actually number one. Yeah, okay. yeah it's yeah. number one for him, <laughs> for sure. And what's so funny is because I asked him early, my first year of marriage, I was like, honey, what's, what can I do to love you the most? And he's like, have sex with me. And I'm like, are you serious? Like out of all the things, that's the way I could love you the most. Yes, hands down. And it was then that I realized, wow, this is a really important thing in his life. Nobody ever really talked to me too much about how important it was. It is a need for our husband. A need. It's called a need because he can't meet that need himself. Or Well, unfortunately, right many try. And that's right. where this goes. If... This is, this is unfortunate. You know, God has this beautiful ordained relationship and the world says, okay, hey, there's many you know, ways outside of marriage to satisfy these needs. This is an issue with pornography being a massive issue, not only in the world, but in Christian circles. And it's guys, it's one of the things that's nearest and dearest to my heart because God had a massive uh, deliverance for me in my own life from that, the bondage of that sin. But in physical intimacy should always, 100% of the time, be directed to and for and with your spouse, period, in my biblical opinion. And I have many things I could share about that. But anyways, I, I think I interrupted you. I don't know where you were going with it, but it's a big deal. And here's the thing, guys, we can tend to, you know, go, okay, physical intimacy is a big deal for us. And guess what? Affection, love, non-sexual touch, truly our wives knowing that we love her for more than just her body, more than just that act is her number one need, knowing that she's truly nourished and cherished. So we have this dynamic that's very interesting there, but it's been a beautiful part of our marriage because, excuse me, Janice has understood that, hey, this is something that I'm going to say that Janice is always open to my advances and not in some like, beat -ups. would you speak to that? It's a big deal. Well, I'm thankful to my mom for giving me the advice to say, she goes, Janice, the answer is always yes unless it's just not going to be feasible for you. Um, more often than not, it's more the, the exception to not have it when he's making advances to me. And you could always reschedule. So I'm not, I'm not a night person. 
And so I'm just like, honey, I promise it'll be great in the morning. Okay. I'll even wake you up. Okay. In a special way, but let's just reschedule. And he's usually good with, Hey, at least we've rescheduled a time and this is going to be a good time, but it is definitely a priority. And, um, you know, oxytocin is released. It's a hormone. They call it the cuddle hormone, but you feel closer to your spouse when you've had intercourse with them. And so the Lord knows how we are wired and how we're made. And it's so important that we are doing that on a consistent basis. And it's, again, for us, I want you to understand this. It's the icing on the cake. Yeah. There's no marriage built on sex. Yeah. And, and if anybody thinks that that's going to be the thing, it's not the thing. It's, it's a part. It's a, it's a beautiful part of, of what God has plan for this marriage. And I do want to reiterate the fact that if your intimate physical life is not well, your marriage is not well. Okay. That it's, it's worth, it's a, it's a way of taking a temperature of where you're at in your marriage. And if, if that part is well, it's going to contribute to wellness in other areas of your marriage and vice versa. That if we're well over here, then that area will be well as well. And it's just, it's worth finding uh, solutions and support in any point in time. Yeah. You have anything else you want to offer? Yeah. Um, I would suggest you read first Peter three, one through five, but respect is so powerful. And I'm bringing up respect in regards to sex, because if a man doesn't feel respected, he doesn't open up. Um, he won't open up to intimacy. So, um, and you only reach true intimacy when somebody totally opens their heart to you. Okay, so if we're being critical of our husbands, if they have anger towards us, they're going to shut down and they're not going to want to open up and they're just going to make love, but it's not going to be intimacy is opening up your heart yes. and everything that you are. It's not just the act. Yeah. And um, so it is the icing on the cake, but it's super important that um, we that there's nothing in our life that we are holding back on or hiding. There has to be a hundred percent transparency. And we're talking when our husbands fall, they need to in, let's say they looked at something too long that they shouldn't have. They need to come to us and talk about that and just be transparent. And is that a difficult conversation? Is it a conversation that's going to rip your soul apart and cause tears and cause grief? Yeah. But we as wives need to be super careful that we are a safe place for our husbands to go. If we're going to overreact and freak out and they're going to just shut down and they're going to feel like this isn't a safe place. I can't go to her and be truly who I am. And that goes with being angry too. You know, we need to be able to express ourselves. Listen, I want to talk to you right now, but I'm angry. I'm angry about something, but I love you and I need to get those feelings out. And so all of these things come into play when it comes to intimacy and transparency. But we want to be, you always use the illustration of a bear rug that is totally skinned or a bear skin. You can't leave any flesh on it. It has to be completely cleaned out for it to dry well and there not be any infection. We can't have stuff in the closet that's rotting and skeletons. And I'm saying if there, if that is in your marriage, it's going to start us to stink and it's going to start to come out in all kinds of ways in your marriage and intimacy is, is definitely going to affect that. And so I would just encourage you if you have that, we've had to, we've had to go through this. You guys, I'm not just speaking to anything that I haven't gone through, have the courage to open up the closet and get to the bottom of it, to scrub the wound out, to get the dirt out. And it hurts once, but it says in James, confess your sins one to another that ye may be healed. Amen. And so that healing can take place and that you can have true transparency and true oneness, because until that happens, you will not have true oneness. So good. And I want to encourage you, if you have not kind of had that as one of your early goals of marriage, and I know that different people come to marriage with different frameworks. Some people are like, hey, the past is the past, whatever, or what I struggle with, that's kind of my deal. I don't want to put that burden on my wife, or I don't want to put that burden on my husband. Um, this is between me and God, whatever. If there's sin or hurt or, or, or difficulty, I would encourage you to practice and I mean practice, the progress 
of transparency. Transparency for many isn't something they can flip a switch and they can go from, I've been hurt, I've been closed off, I've been wounded, I've, been, I've struggled, I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, whatever. And it's not something they necessarily can go, I just wanna unload the entire truck on you right now. And I wanna encourage you to start opening those doors if there's some closed doors. And just with the goal of, Lord, walk us to a place of 100% transparency. There's nothing hidden, there's nothing unknown, there's nothing, the goal of love is to be fully known and loved in spite of it. Guys, we're human. We're so broken outside of our dynamic salvation in Christ. And, and we bring that to our marriages. And yet the beauty of Christ in us is that we've been forgiven, we've been washed, we've been new, we're clean, old things have passed away, we're these new creations, and we need to walk in that identity. And if there's things that are sins that beset you or things that have encumbered you or weighed you down, do not hesitate to start to open the door to one another and seek forgiveness if it's needed or prayer. She is such a graceful blessing to me in the sense that she is my greatest supporter in prayer and in, 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 in helping me address any of the shortcomings in my own life um, with someone. The goal in oneness is to have a shared a journey that of support together. So these areas, they're big deals, guys. I don't want to think, act like this is easy peasy. This isn't something you go out on one date and you solve all your, oh, hey, we're hundred percent golden now, but, and many go years and are never known. And that's a shame to go through your life and to feel like there's parts of you closed off that you can't be, be um, known or forgiven, um, whatever. So just know that there's a grace in marriage. And if you see your loved one, is that that vessel that Christ died for, that he's or she is the one that, that we get to come to with that grace. There's forgiveness, there's repentance, there's renewal, uh, there's restoration, there's life, um, there's this uh, cleanliness and, and purity that allows you to move forward in a new level of intimacy. And realize this really helped me to understand that my husband is not the enemy. My husband is never the enemy. Satan is out to kill, to steal, and to destroy, to cause division, yeah. and to rip you apart. Yeah. He wants to bury, he wants to hide, he wants to put in isolation. Yeah. And Christ wants oneness, and openness, and forgiveness. And so when we get on the same page, even though I've been hurt deeply by let some, you know, sin, which I'm, the feelings are mutual back and forth with he's been hurt. Um, it's coming together and just saying, you know what, Chad, you're not the enemy. Right now, we're going to pray. I am on your side. Let's pray against that right now. And I just want you to know we're on the same team. Chad knows that he can call me. He travels a lot. He goes down to LA. We'll spend a few days. And we've had to work through like, you know, times when he's had to call me up in the middle of the night and just say, I'm feeling so weak right now. I just need you to pray for me right now because I feel like I'm succumbed to temptation. And instead of me freaking out, like, am I not enough? And why this, you know, early in my marriage, I used to feel that way. I don't anymore. I understand. I'm like, thank you so much for calling me. Yes. Let's pray about it right Amen. now. And we pray about it. And it's amazing. Amen. He can literally feel satanic demonic stuff released from him a burden lifted for sure when we pray amen and there's victory amen. and we just thank the lord that he always gives us the victory amen and that's the kind of oneness that we want to get to is that we can come to our spouse and feel like you're going to be on my side even though i've blown it or i've been weak amen so. and again it's so beautiful because i think that's what god gave us our spouses for you know, the fact that Janice can cry out to me when she's feeling weak or overwhelmed or beat down, whatever. And to be that support that literally turns to the Lord on behalf of your loved one, it says, Lord, you've got her. You, you're the one who sustains. You're the one who's given us life. We help believe for one another at times in such a beautiful way. But this, this all contributes to, again, oneness, which is the opposite of isolation. I just, I keep reiterating, it's oneness that we want. And oneness is hard fought. Guys, it isn't given to you. Oneness is being willing to have some of those challenging conversations, willing to confess when you're wrong. You know, there's, there's something really terrible sometimes for guys. You know, we, we like to be right. I like to be right. I like to make great decisions. I like to be respected and think I'm doing all the right things. 
And when you're faced with your children or your wife telling you, coming to you and saying, daddy, I don't know, this seems off, or it seems like you made it, this isn't right, or, or, or I'm showing a wrong attitude. It takes a lot. Scripture says if we humble ourselves, that he will exalt us. And, and he wants to take us and he, he, he wants to, through humility, bring us the, the oneness that we so desire deep down. So it impacts all of these things. And again, out of intimacy with and transparency in your communication, your life, your marriage, comes incredible elevation of your physical intimacy. It's just all of a sudden, there's just this true kinship, this, this soul connection that is so much more than the physical that just says it's, it's glorious and it's honoring to God and it's honoring to one another and it's beautiful and it's, it's powerful. So, and what helps me when I've been hurt too, is to think about what Christ did for me. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. I didn't have to clean up myself of, you know, and make myself great or anything. He forgave me. And so Amen. I have to put myself in that situation and say, Hey, you've done this for me, Christ. I'm going to do this for you. And Amen. Let's say, have fun. We just talked about some of the hard times. like For physical intimacy? Yeah. On. Oh, whatever. We, we won't go into all the fun. Right. I mean, but I mean, we could. It's supposed to be fun. Hey, I will say this. That's an important point. Yeah. It really is. And it's something that we really encourage newlyweds when we talk to young couples is that, hey, this is a gift from God. And read Song Solomon together. Okay, guys? It's a love letter. And there's all sorts of joy and freedom and creativity and abundance in physical intimacy. And I will say this, be practical. Guys, there's times for it to be quick, okay? You, don't, you have a lot of kids, be quick, you know? We say, hey, we got time for a quickie. Quickies are great, you know? Then there's times for, hey, let's spend all day or whatever, we're, we're together. And, and, you know, people often go, well, how do you have, you know, intimacy when you have all these kids? Uh, you know what? We've never struggled with that. We've lived in trailers, we've lived in... I mean, we've lived in all kinds of weird, six, small, cramped quarters. There's just never been an issue, guys. Be creative. Quit being so paranoid, some of you. Some of you are like a little freaked out. You know, let loose a little bit. Some of you girls need to let go of, of whatever and like just take a little risk, you know? Okay. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and Or maybe saying. some of the guys. Maybe <laughs> some of you guys are a little like, hey, lights out, nine o'clock, everybody in bed. Get over that. Sometimes it's like uh, mommy and I get home from a trip. It's like mommy and I need to go have a talk. Yeah, we do. We do. And we talk some and we do more than that. You know, it's like whatever. We run off to the, we can find, always find a spot. So my point is, I mean, be creative for crying out loud and keep it fun. It's, it, she's your playmate, you know, and the ability to, you know, appropriately, I mean, Adam and Eve had it going on. They were outside in the garden running around naked. I mean, try it sometime. Seriously, God, that was his first intention. I don't know. As long as, you know, nobody's around and whatever, don't get caught. But I just, just be to free. Say, okay? I wanted to say one more thing. Yeah. Is that, you know, moms that have little babies, I had to learn this. You know, as soon as, well, let's say we were in the act of it, and all of a sudden the baby cries, and I'm like, oh, the baby. You know, I've had to learn to say, you know what? The baby's going to be okay. It can cry for a few minutes. But really making your husband the priority and then your children. Yeah. Done a good job of that. Done a good job of that. All right. Mentally Hey, work on hey, we're all in this. Anyways, my, my, my last thing on this, pursue intimacy, more than just physical intimacy, more than just an act, more than this, oh, a duty of a wife. Janice has worked really hard at, at going, I'm going to be great at this. I'm going to really put my head in the right spot so I can be present for him. She's, she's just been so beautiful in her, her giving me that way. I have to learn to understand, oh, hey, you've been thrashed all day by all these kiddos. I come in, finally get you to bed at midnight, and then I'm expecting to be like, yeah, you know, and I have to go, well, wait a minute, that's not really loving. You know, it's just this dance of caring for one another, ultimately, that intimacy takes place. And, and when it does, and we're honoring one another, it's, it's golden. Golden. It's always good. You know, we could talk so much about this. Oh, let's do it, please. No, I just want to, like some other little practical tips. It's like having a clean bedroom, having clean sheets, feeling clean physically. We take a shower every night together. It's just kind of our routines, but these are some little things that are just important. A fan, get a big fan. I've lived in a trailer. White noise, baby. You know, we got a big old fan. We had six kids. And of course they were all little and they were knocked out at early times. So it was much easier. I wouldn't do that now. But um, 
We well, would. We'd put, yeah. just get a bigger fan. Yeah. yeah. So, but I will say this, we've never been caught by our kids. So that's pretty good. We've never been caught by our kids. <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. We're, we're, we're wanting about a thousand there. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So another question, Janice, read Number it, five. please. Number yeah. Five? Yeah. Okay. What are the daily disciplines that you have developed together individually and collectively to thrive? Why don't you speak to that first? Okay. So um, morning routines and evening routines are super important. They're super important for your confidence. And this may sound really dumb, but making your bed, there, uh, there is like the first successful thing that you can do, honestly. And um, so that's definitely a habit. Um, I always get dressed and instead of like lounging around and like sweats and everything. When my day starts going, it is going. And if I'm not in front of the ball, I've got nine kids here that are just life's happening. And so I want to be dressed and ready to go. Um, um, you know, I, practical things, ladies, you probably want to hear about this, but, um, you know, I get up, I drink two glasses of water. I walk to the laundry room. I throw laundry in. And then I'm, by this time I'm awake. I spend time in the word and, um, and then pull out the meat for the dinner that night. Okay. <laughs> These are just little practical things, but, um, individually having re regular meal times at eight, one and six. So people know the expectation and when to start them. I exercise four to five times a week, uh, at least like 30 minutes a day. Um, you know, I'm doing a plank challenge with my kids right now. I take supplements every single day. My health is super important. It is like right up there next to my relationship with the All Lord. Right. And um, the way you feel is super important. When, the, when we started this conversation today, I was said it's life is all about managing your energy and prioritizing. In my life, my life is going so fast. You would think I always have an excuse for why I don't need to exercise or why whatever. And I just chisel out the time. I fight for it every single day. I've got to take care of myself. And the result of that has been amazing. The Lord, you know, I haven't been sick in like over 16 years. And, um, so there's little practical things that, you know, I take Neolife life supplements. Um, can if I, you're looking for a good supplement. Can I speak to that real quick too, guys, every one of us, I, I think, like I said, she has her routine. She has the way that she goes about things. Um, and, and again, I think sometimes there's this picture of, oh, marital unity is, oh, we do these little, all these little special moments along the way. And we have our, you know, collaborated and coordinated routines and things. I, on the other hand, I wake up and I immediately put on my running shoes. Cause I found that if I'm, um, after I drink my glass of water, I, I put on running shoes and I want to get out in God's creation. I don't care what the weather is because I just, I have found that I can spend incredible time in fellowship with the Lord, just walking or running. Um, like I said, quoting scripture, listening to an encouraging word um, through scripture or podcast or whatever. Janice needs her journal. She needs her Bible, her well-lit space. that's quiet. It's we're so individual. And I think it's so important that you find routines and structures that work for you. They give you a simple confidence that you're going to be able to be all that God created you to that day for your life, for him, for your marriage, for your children, for all the roles and responsibilities that he's given you. And I think so much uh, comes in your marriage if neither one of you is, or I'm going to say either one of you is neglecting those basics, okay? Neglecting those daily disciplines of, hey, what allows me to flourish as a human being, allows me to be uh, bring my best uh, thinking. And God, I believe, wants us to walk in his power and grace and to steward the resources, and including the time and energy that he's given us. So for me, again, I've found such a beautiful scripture uh, or truth out of Romans 12, 1 and 2, where he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. Some of you, I, some of the questions that came through dealt with, uh, how do you deal with a spouse that has depression? Guys, I was, I was that spouse. I, for many years, I would struggle very emotionally, high and low, um, with, with my, own, um, my own thoughts. And I really, over the last 15 years, I've seen God, by his grace, renew my mind. And yes, there's a physical component. There's a spiritual component. There's a mental component. There's all of these things. But he's allowed me to wake up every single day. And one of the most profound daily disciplines I have is literally when I wake up in the morning, I'm still in bed right here. I say, thank you, Lord. 
thank you, Lord. And I fill in the blank, Lord, what am I thankful for? Because I found that when I'm thanking the Lord, I'm believing him. Mm-hmm. And when I'm believing him, I'm, I'm walking in his power. Scripture in Psalm 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I literally picture God as this beautiful fortress and I see his gates swing open wide to me in the morning and I get to enter his presence with thanksgiving. And then I say, and then enter his courts with praise. I get to praise him. And those parts of my brain have been reinforced by constant repetitive thought, plasticity, neuroplasticity. If you ever want to read a great book, read Switch on Your Brain. It talks about how science is catching up with scripture and the things we think about matter. And God has actually given us the ability to have the mind of Christ, to renew our mind, to think according to truth, and to think according to Philippians 4.8 as a filter. And he says, whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely, of good report, worthy of virtue, worthy of praise, think on these things. And I'll tell you what, that kind of thinking is critical for me being the believer that God's called me to be. Call it's critical to me being a husband that can love my wife. I'm a difficult dude. I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm a freak. I have way too many ideas. I can make all kinds of messes. I am scatterbrained. I can really destroy a family really quickly, left unattended. And God has said, Hey, Chad, I need you to be thinking according to my word, my truth, and, and you need to be aligned with me. And, and outside of that, I'm dangerous. I really am. And He says, But I've got you. And he's allowed me that daily time to, to just, and it's weird because praying without ceasing used to be like, well, what's that all about? I literally, I, people probably think I'm psychotic, but everywhere I go, I'm talking to the Lord. I just, as I walk along the way, Lord, hey man, this just showed up. Hey, got this call. Give me wisdom in this meeting. I have no idea what I'm doing. Lord, my daughter just walked in and asked me a question. I have no idea what the answer is to this. Please give me a wisdom. Show me something so I can give her something that's useful for her. It's the internal dialogue of my heart now, but those little daily disciplines of just abiding and, and thinking through and, and to do that, I want to say one thing. I've had to turn off the news. I've had to turn off a bunch of other things that I used to take into my brain and I've had to unplug from it. Yeah, even in this time of COVID and all this craziness, guys, you are his disciples, you're, we're his, his children and we need to protect our thinking space and the one way we can do that is, again, taking captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, which is, if it's not serving me, it's not building me up, it's not edifying, equipping me to be who God's called me to be in the roles, I don't want it going in my brain. And so I'm very crazy possessive about what that happens. But your daily disciplines are so important, and they're going to be different for each one of you and how yeah. you do it. And so that's the way we thrive. And it really builds confidence in you when you feel like you're in charge of your day instead of your days in charge of you. And I know things start to go sideways, but just having that stability in the morning of those things that you're putting into yourself and taking care of yourself, super important. But also we do something as a family where at breakfast time, Chad always reads from God's word or I read from God's word and share real time what God is doing in my life. Huge. Very transparent and open about what is going on in my life. And, you know, sometimes I'll be found in tears at the table. Sometimes we have the kids share what they're learning. And that's interesting. I was like, hey, we're going to start from the oldest and go down tomorrow. It's you, Baylor. Next is you, Kelsey. You come to the table. You tell me what the Lord is teaching you about. All the way down to Cordy. Cordy. Yeah. Six. Talk to five. us. You're in charge today, you know? Yep. So that's super important. Another thing that helps our family thrive is having a Bible time in the evening. This isn't just like 100% happens all the time, but for the majority of the time it does. Even when we have guests over to our house for dinner, we'll say, hey, let's go into the front room. Would you like to enjoy a Bible time with us? And it's ministered to people so much to see a family sit together, sing some songs. It's my favorite time of the day because that time, you know, I'm we're massaging each other, brushing each other's hair, you know, funny things cut from the day, you know, it's just, it's a good time. So those are some of the habits that we do that really bring us together. Also, we always pray, um, pray together before we go to bed at night. And Chad always starts out with, thank you, Lord. And you know what? He has been so beat up from work sometimes. And I know what his day happened. And I hear him sometimes lay there and go, thank you, Lord. And then he just like pauses he has to think of something to be thankful for. And he just starts, okay, thank you for this. Thank you for that. 
And um, so no matter if he's in LA, if he's in Chicago, doesn't matter where we are in the world, we always um, talk to each other before we go to bed and pray together. So I want to see, so, so good, Denise. I want to say one thing about those family Bible times, guys. Family Bible times, again, can be so profoundly simple. And I just don't want there to be like some prof- you know, like complication around like, oh, guy, how, how does that work? Some of you have been doing these for years. Guys, it's literally so simple as, you know, sitting around in a circle and singing a song of praise to the Lord, having one of the kids share something. It's opening your Bible and reading a chapter together. It's so simple. There's no complexity to this. You do not need to have gone to seminary. You, and, and trust me in this, guys, God has called us as the spiritual, again, heads of our home to be the one to just initiate that. Or, or my wife will often go, Chad, it's 8.30, do, you want to, do we wanna do a Bible time tonight? Cause I get all busy with everything. Absolutely, come on in, register. But the ability to bring scripture front and center, to have conversations about what the Lord is practically doing in your life, it's absolutely foundational. I'm convinced to seeing children raised up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. And if we wanna see them, our faith transfer from one generation to the next, it's not gonna be because they were in youth group or they went to the right summer camp or they're at the right church with the right young people and the right pastors. It's none of it, and none of it. I'm gonna repeat, it's none of it. All that can be zero. We're seeing eight out of 10 walk away from their faith. And it's not because there's not enough church activity. It's because there's not enough just honest, transparent sharing from mother and father in the home. Proverbs so clearly says, my son, listen to your father's instruction. Forsake not the law of your mother. Write them on the table of your heart. Guys, it's just a simple walking with our kids. So it's hugely important for us. One last habit yeah. is um, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 talks about not going to bed with an angry heart um, because it, it allows Satan to come in and get a root of bitterness in there. If your husband, if you're angry, your husband, all of a sudden, first of all, he's snoring over there. I snore. And all of a sudden I'm like, how can he go to bed right now? I'm so angry. And all of a sudden you find yourself just slandering your husband. And you do this all, at night? All night. No, I'm saying it's While a sleep, habit. You do this? No, oh. it's been a temptation. I would stay awake to watch this. If you're gonna- <laughs> But I'm saying Satan can get a root in there and you can spend all that time undermining your husband. And all of a sudden you've been deceived by Satan. You're looking through Satan's eyes at your husband. Now, this is who he is. And that's not right. It's not who I am. There's a reason why the Lord says, don't go to bed when you're angry. Go to bed when you're angry. And sometimes we'll say, Hey, have we gotten to a place of, you know, can this we go important. to bed and we'll pick this up in the morning because we're both so exhausted right now and we choose to, and we pick it up and we finish it in the morning. When we do that, we're going to bed half angry. Yeah. Yeah. At we least we've to, talked about it. No, it's okay it. to go to bed half angry, not full angry. If you go to bed half angry <laughs> with the thought that we're going to revisit this in the morning and clean up the other half, you're golden, but just have a, at least sort of an agreement. I think that is a good word. What's another question? We have a few more minutes here. What do we I got? Um, what is it? Number seven, how to stop trying to change your spouse to what you want him to be. Oh, wow. Like exercise more. Ouch. You know, what's so funny is this question, how to change your spouse. Um, it's a, it's a real interesting one because there's so much, um, <laughs> it's so interesting this last week, I'm going to tell him, uh, we're literally in the bathroom right here behind us. And Janice is like, um, so Chad, well, this is like a week ago, maybe 10 days ago. She's like, so Chad, uh, do you want to like start, um, stop eating carbs and stop eating sugar and, and like do some kind of challenge with me so that I can lose like eight pounds? I didn't say eight, about five. Five, whatever, the number, I'm right? I'm going through menopause, okay? So you, things start to change. Hey, whatever. So, so she says this, right? Yeah. And I immediately, it's so funny, I've been literally stewing in my mind that ever since I, I haven't traveled I, when I travel, I eat like a machine. I'm super guarded. My kids can consume a lot of uh, carb calories. They eat bread and they eat pancakes, they eat stuff that I just don't do well with. So I have personally had put on a few pounds here at the house eating totally abnormal for me. My routines had been, my structures had been changed around. And I was feeling like I was guilty of not maintaining my A game. So when she asked me, hey, would you help me do this? I was like, what are you trying to say? You know, you're saying I, I'm like 
chunky lunky here or I'm like not taking care of myself. I've got all defensive. I literally did. I was like, and she's like, no, no, whoa, whoa. I'm talking about- You are so self-centered. You're just (laughs) totally thinking about yourself. (laughs) But it's interesting because when you try to, she was honestly just wanting support in her goals, but it's interesting. These can be uh, topics that can be a little rife with sensitivity, right? I mean, when you sit there and I want to encourage you, if you want to change your spouse in any way, number one, get on your knees. And I mean it. Get on your knees and let your request be made known to the Lord. Just say, Lord, work, do a work in my spouse's heart and mine. Lord, do a work. Pray, 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 pray. Secondly, model. If you want your spouse to get out of bed and, and spend time in the Word, you just go about getting out of bed and spending time in the Word and let the Holy Spirit do the work. I'm telling you, that's so powerful when you model what you think is good. If you want to be healthy, be healthy. And your spouse, living with you will learn and, and will be challenged by your, I've seen so many times where I've been maybe uh, uh, playing a little lower game than Janice in some area of my life. And I see her conduct and it calls me to something higher. And it's not because she's nagging me or she's like that, you know, like being nibbled to death by a duck, you know? I mean, it's just like, what a, what a terrible way to live. Right. And no, no, I mean, scripture warns about that, a drippy faucet guys or girls. I mean, just dripping on one another or nagging or, pestering or I wish you would do this or I wish you would you know read your bible more or you should be more of the spiritual leader or you should be a better wife or you should submit guys those places they don't have a room in a marriage pray model and then have third have a courageous conversation at some point if there's something that's weighing on you and just say hey I want to share something with you and have a conversation and ask questions and and what do you want in this area of your life can I support you in any way? And believe me, it still may blow up on you. Okay, that's, that's the way it is. And it's okay. Because once things have blown up, then they can simmer down and you can actually sort through, the, sort through the little mess and figure out a better plan forward. But I would just encourage you that, uh, you know, the best way to, to see change in your, in your spouse is to pray, to model, and then to have an honest conversation and, uh, and allow and be open to God using you in their life. Yeah, and what go to say? First Peter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection unto your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they also may without the word be won by the conversation or the conduct, conduct of the wives. Yeah. So without a word, while they behold your chaste conversation or conduct yeah. coupled with fear or respect, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek, and quiet spirit. Nobody ever thrives with a critical spirit. I was raised in a family that was a little more that way. And um, so I've had to work on that because my tendency, you know, I love my mom dearly, but she always thought, you know, it's my job. I'm your mother to tell you the things that are wrong with you, you know? And um, I'm just like, okay, I need to hear some good things too, though. So, um, And it says, if there be any virtue in Philippians 4, if there be any virtue, it didn't say every virtue. If you see anything good in your husband, bring it up. Talk about it. If there be any virtue. Yeah. It didn't say every virtue. That's so good. And I love that point. Being the good finder in your marriage. You see what you're looking for. Oh, it's true. Being the good finder, you know, so good. Um, anyways, I don't know if that answered that question, but that was, that was one that came in. Um, I think we have time for another here. Let's see. Um, let's see. Yeah. Let's talk about this real quick. We, I think we did a little bit. Um, do you think it was sufficient? Well, there's a lot of people that are depressed. And so I think we really should, um, touch base a little bit more on this. Sure. So, um, it's definitely a physical, a spiritual and a, and a uh, mental part of us that makes up our emotions and um physically there it could be as simple as eating sugar or living on energy drinks or living on coffee and tapping into um adrenals that are not naturally producing energy and you're just sapping your body it could be something that simple but that'll just take you into a downward spiral um i've talked to a lot of people with depression um Apparently, six salmon oil of the right kinds of salmon oil, which you could talk to us about later, um, is a brain food, and it actually feeds your brain and will help you from going into depression. 
I have never experienced postpartum depression um, after having a baby. Um, I do take salmon oil on a regular basis and I'm very well may attribute it to that. But um, exercise is super important. Huge. Something as simple as going out, even if you just walk and get out in the fresh air. And, you know, I used to think, oh, it's raining outside, can't go outside. And my husband would say, honey, you're waterproof. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am waterproof. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, sleep, just being sleep deprived can add to depression. And this sounds so basic, but it's amazing how many people don't get this. Yeah. And so just go back to the, to the basics. And then spiritually, like Chad was saying, giving thanks in everything, like 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 tells us, um, if there's hidden sin, take inventory of your heart. If there's hidden sin, that will throw you into depression. Um, the Lord came to set captives free Amen. and to make us more than conquerors, like I started out saying um, earlier this morning. But take inventory of what's going on inside. Are you avoiding a hard conversation? Are you harboring bitterness towards someone? Is there unresolved conflict in you? Um, these are all things. If you're not being true to who you are, if you're portraying something on the outside and you're feeling something totally different on the inside, there is a conflict. This stuff can throw you into a depression. And um, mentally, it's super important that we're free. The Lord came to set us free. Amen. He wants you to be who you are. And accept and embrace yourself for who you are. Love who you are. He wants to use who you are. And so um, embracing that. And um, also, it may be that you're not, if you're sitting around playing video games all day and you're feeding your brain Netflix and you're not feeding yourself things that are challenging you or just as, as important as it is for physical food, your mental food is very important. You've got to protect your brain space and what is going in there. So it's super important that we are accomplishing and we're growing in our life. If you're not growing, you're going to go into a depression or you could very easily. Very, very so, easily could. Anyway. So important. I, again, to be healthy and whole, it's such a joy to be married to healthy and whole uh, a person, right? You want to come to marriage with that health and that wholeness. And these are things, again, worth looking into. It, is it physical? Is it spiritual? Is it emotional? I, again, look back at my own life and it was a, a combination of many of those things that have that contributed to my own, I'm going to say challenges in that area. And just to find freedom has a, such a relationship to our identity in Christ and believing him for what he says is true. And we'll, we won't spend much more time on that. I think we're getting, again, close to the end here. I want to um, look at a couple more questions. Guys, communication. We're going to touch on it real briefly. Everything that we're talking about will, in a marriage will either be blessed by effective communication or can be hampered by ineffective communication. And if one of the things that we found in, I mean, couples that have been married three months, a year, year and a half, already they're running up against subjects in their marriage that become, uh, I'm gonna say hot potatoes or triggers, right? Where we can't go there, we can't talk about that. If I say that, she explodes or she shuts down. Or if she says that, he runs away or he literally can't deal with it. And, and these can be around some very important topics in your life. And isolation happens when you have conversation after conversation that you cannot bring understanding or, or res resolve. And so you start growing further and further apart. It's literally a conversation here, a conversation there. Intimacy, on the other hand, is the more that we can have effective communication that brings us to oneness. And I want to say this really clear. The goal of communication in marriage is not agreement. And you're going, well, then why are we even talking about it if we aren't going to get to a place where we agree? And I want to say that again. The goal, in my opinion, in communication in marriage is not agreement. It's not 100%. Oh, yeah, I think exactly like you think now. We can now have a happy marriage because I now think like you think. It's not that. The goal of effective communication in marriage is understanding. Deeper understanding. If I can truly hear the heart of my wife, if I can understand why it is that she feels so strongly or she believes a certain thing or she is confident that this is the way it should be. 
if I can just even understand it. We are at the 90 yard line, as far as I'm concerned, in reaching our goals in communication. Can I say something really Please quick? Please do. It's amazing. Whenever I just say, I can understand how you feel that way. He just goes, oh, like you get me, you know? And that doesn't mean that I agree with what he's talking about. I try to get out of my shoes and into his shoes from his perspective. I can understand how you'd feel that way. It's huge. That's all he really wanted. He didn't necessarily want me just to agree with it. And so I have learned to use those words. It's super important, guys, I think for both husbands and wives. Because once, again, think about what, I, what is understanding. Understanding is being known. Oh, you know me. You know my hurt. You understand my fear. You understand my, my anxiousness around that subject or my insecurity. You understand. And because you understand, you now can respond or react in a way that can honor that awareness. And I think sometimes in communication, especially as newlyweds or young couples, we're like, oh, well, we need to hash that out so we can really get on this, so we can agree. Guess what? We've been married 26 years, 27 in, 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 in August, and we still don't agree on certain things. Yeah, guess what? We don't agree on, I mean, the core of things that are important to us, we do. But there are areas of life, theology, I mean, child, you know, training, we're 98% we're on the same page, but there's certain things where we're going to come at it at a different angle. But I'm telling you what, understanding allows so much grace. And, and so if you can go into communication with that framework, that mm -hmm. my goal is not to get her to agree with me or get him to completely agree with me. My goal is to truly have her or him understand, or better yet, my goal is to truly understand her. And that takes a skill. That takes an actual disciplined effort because when she communicates something to me, I, if it's a trigger, if she flips a switch that, you know, like gets me going, I can completely shut down and we start going back and forth. Okay. And now all of a sudden it's a fruitless, oh, I feel this way. Well, no, you said that. Well, what will we get? And it becomes a, a debate, it becomes an argument. And I want to tell you, it's okay to fight, but just fight fair and fight according to some rules that you agree on. And our goal in, in communication is that we always want to honor one another. We never want to attack the individual as much as possible. We want to see ourselves on the same side of the table with the issue out here. Talk about the issue out here. We want to have one person that's sharing their heart and the other person that's listening and receiving. This is hard to do, people. I'm telling you, it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. If you can literally go through a, what there's a, uh, a ministry called Noble Call and the conversation that they have, they call it a courageous conversation. Feel free to look it up. It gives you like 10 or 12 steps. It's a little busy for me. We've adopted ours down to kind of like seven little simple things. Maybe it's even five. But the goal of it is this. And I want you to hear my heart. If Janice has an issue or I have an issue and one of you is probably going to uh, be a little more, I'm going to say persistent in communication than the other. Okay. You're going to find this, meaning you need to get resolution or a little more clarity or a little more, you know, uh, oneness in that. But it's important that the other person literally puts them in the place of, I'm just going to receive. I'm not going to blame, complain, or explain. I'm going to repeat back what I'm hearing every single time until I get to the root of it. And I won't give you the examples, but if you check out that ministry, Noble Call, look at Courageous Conversation. And then I encourage you, if you have things that are keeping you isolated right now, or you feel like you're between you, or issues that are unresolved, sit down and go through that process. If you can't make it through that process, mm -hmm. and many couples can't, because they've developed some patterns of unhealthy communication, get somebody that loves you and is willing to moderate. Say, hey, here's our rules for communication. Just help referee us while we walk through this. And I'm serious, we've done it with many couples and seen them for the very first time actually come to understand what their spouse was saying. And there's nothing more beautiful than having your spouse understand you and, and to be under, known and understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else around communication? Not around communication. We have three minutes left. I wanted to end with one last question because I thought it was a great one. Let's do it. It We're says, gonna... what's the main thing that helps couples fall in love with each other over and over again? Oh, that's good. Over and over again. I keep falling in love with you. And for, from my perspective as a woman, it's focusing on my husband's top needs. I'm constantly going one, two, three, four, five. How am I doing one, two, three, four, five? 
sex, respect, companion, recreational companionship, attractive, and domestic support. Those are the five things. I'm constantly, so those are men's most pressing needs. Yeah. Okay, if you yeah. focus on those, that's going to be great. And the other thing I wanted to say was uh, words. The biggest prediction of a successful marriage are the words spoken. It's not your income. It's not your affection. It's not your education. It's your words. And if you think about how did you fall in love, you fall in love by being careful with what you said and what you did. And we fall out of love because we stop caring and and we say and do things that are careless and hurtful. And so, you know, Proverbs 18, 20 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Good marriages use lots of good words and bad marriages use a lot of bad words. So yeah. who are the people that you enjoy to be with, being with? They speak life and they're encouraging to you. So um, that's so good. Got to focus on the positive. And then, okay, so mine was, Focus on the top five means um, your words, prioritizing your marriage. That means putting energy into it. It's got to be first, put energy into your marriage, have grace for each other, and don't sweat the small stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. So good, Janice. I want to I challenge you with one thought as you leave too. Are you a marriage investor? Have you thought of yourself as a marriage investor? You know, People know that to, to be financially well, they have to save. They have to learn about what it means to manage finances and they, they have to discipline themselves to a certain study. A lot of people come to marriage and expect it to just work. And I know that one of the big guiding mindsets the Lord has given us from the beginning of time in our marriage is that, hey, this is an area that we're going to continually invest. We're going to seek out resources. We're going to read books together or on our own. We're gonna to go to marriage retreats periodically. We're, I think you're a marriage investor already because you're on this call. Mm -hmm. You took the time out of your day to just say, hey, I, I care about this stuff. And I'm telling you what, it, to the level you'll invest is a level that you'll be relationship rich. I believe it with all my heart. Mm -hmm. and, and many of us need more work than other people. And that's, it's okay. It's all about progress. It's not about perfection. God's grace is so sufficient in all of this. And man, I, I just, I want to tell you, there's so many great resources out there for marriage. And, and if, and guys, gals, you know, there's a book called Love Life for Every Married Couple, Dr. Ed Wheat. It's a classic. It's written in the 80s. So goldenly true. Just re read it recently. Um, there's this classic, again, that we've kind of referenced, His Needs, Her Needs. Another phenomenal, great read. There's one, Love and Respect. I'm reading one right now by Gary Thomas called Cherish, because I learned recently that I, I need to refresh my uh, ability to speak to Janice in kindness, in kind words. It's, it's critical to the fabric of our marriage. There's a, another resource, Art of Marriage. This is a little like home study course. Guys, we have bookcases full of these things that over the years, you just revisit as a tool, as a resource. We've been mentored by many precious couples through their writings. And I know that there's a lot of things out there and we get busy in life. Mm -hmm. But periodically, if your priorities are clear, you'll go back and you'll revisit and realize that, hey, stay a learner in this area. We're learning more at 26 years in, and I can't imagine how much we'll be learning at 30 and 40 and 50 years by God's grace. Yeah. Anyways, we love you so much. Um, and it just, again, are so grateful for you caring about your marriage. Mm -hmm. And I know right now, I just want to acknowledge there's some marriages on this call that are hurting. And I want you to know that we're praying for you. And we're confident that he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. He's got you. And we've seen some marriages go from absolutely destructive and hurtful and damaged. And we've seen them come to just incredible life, giving fullness in God, in his grace and his mercy. And I just, that's our prayer for you today. If you're at that place of, of difficulty, we pray that you would continue to press in to the Lord, to persevere, to, to look for him, to see, to be your all in all. And uh, anyways, we just love you all so much. And that's going to conclude our time. I'm so sorry it's, if it went long. I, I feel like in some ways I'd love to talk to you guys all day. But just uh, may God bless you guys. And we want to open it up. Cheryl, can you unmute everybody? And we can 
kind of say our farewells, but just love you all. Bye. 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 Guys. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you guys are awesome. Thank you. 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 Hi. 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 Um, oh, I guys. love you. Love right. you all yeah. so much. Hey guys. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Let's do a part two. Oh. 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 Oh.